any legislation that divides our countries to come to the House floor for any consideration. It is action and deeds that build trust. And our friendship is too important. The dangers we face today are too real to let there be any misgivings between us. You know, like my House colleagues, I understand that America is not safer when we back away from Israel. America is safer when we stand with Israel. So, if there's one thing that I would ask you to take away from tonight, it is this. My colleagues and I will do everything we can to strengthen our friendship, not just with words, but with concrete achievements. No taking friends for granted. No leaving them in the lurch. A friend, a friend is a priority, and American leaders should act like it. Now, that's what I think most Americans believe on both sides of the aisle. But I do hear people raising doubts every now and then. They say things like, the Middle East, the Middle East is a mess. It's none of our business. Why are we involved? Why are we picking sides? They say that our alliance is not an asset, but a liability. They say that it hamstrings America, that it cuts against our interests. And in my experience, it does us no good to airily wave off our opponents or to dismiss them as narrow-minded, to be high-minded about it. That doesn't bridge the divide. That deepens the divide. Instead, we need to confront our critics' arguments head-on, have a real conversation. And I would say to them that I firmly believe that the friendship between our two countries is not just in Israel's interest, but it is in America's interests. It is good for Israel, it is good for America, and it is good for the world. You know what I mean? It's really just a lesson in history. You know, for many years, we avoided what Thomas Jefferson called entangling alliances. We were not as strong as a country back then. And the great powers, they wanted to use us for their own purposes. There was no reason to play the pawn in their chess game. So, we stayed out. Well, that all changed in World War II. We learned the hard way that even if you don't go looking for trouble, trouble has a way of finding you. You know, the day that, that Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, we realized that two oceans could no longer protect us anymore. We'd grown too strong for our enemies to ignore us. Our interests now reached across the world, and so did the threats. We couldn't beat back Nazi, Nazi panzers in North America or North Africa. We couldn't liberate the islands of the South Pacific and climb the cliffs of Normandy all on our own. We had to work with other countries who shared our objectives. We had to make sure that our allies knew we stood with them. We had to lead a global alliance. After the war was over, a new threat emerged, an aggressive and expansionist Soviet Union. The Soviets were setting up puppet regimes all across Eastern Europe. They were aiming missiles at our friends in Western Europe. They were on the march in Asia and Africa and South America. And so, we faced a choice. Either we could withdraw from the world, arm ourselves to the teeth, and make ourselves into a garrison state, or we could pursue a forward-leaning defense, create a community of free nations, keep open the lanes of commerce, build institutions that would foster cooperation. And that, that is exactly what we did. These were the years that we created NATO and GATS and the International Monetary Fund. And of course, 
in 1948. We were the first country to recognize the state of Israel just minutes after she declared her independence. Both the Cold War and the World War taught us that free countries are safer when we work with each other, when we stand by each other, when we trust each other. Because then, when a threat arises, we can confront it together. Well, the threats, the threats are very different now. North Korea thumbs its nose at the world as it plays with its nuclear weapons. Iran openly backs tyrants and funds terrorist groups as it jockeys for dominance in the Middle East. And emboldened, Russia is only too happy to try and reclaim its neighbors as its client states. And with the rise of ISIS, an even deadlier strain of Islamist extremism has taken hold. Once again, we face an aggressive militant ideology with an assist from a gang of rogue states. So why is our relationship with Israel so important? <laughs> because in the fight against terrorism and proliferation, our interests are one and the same. For the terrorists, Israel is the first target, and we are the ultimate target. <laughs> and you know why? You know why this is? Because we share the same values. Israel, like us, is a liberal democracy in a sea of authoritarian regimes. So when America helps both countries, both countries become stronger. Both countries are protecting our way of life. Just remember, Israel does not fund terrorism in other countries, but it does help the New York Police Department fight terrorism in our country. This is the crux of the matter. I think the current administration, I think they understand that we need our allies, but it fails to understand what our allies need. They need more than vague assurances that we've got their back. They need to see with their own eyes that the measure of our full commitment, and I don't say this to try and castigate or to blame anybody. I say this to bring clarity to the situation that we are facing. I think this is the most fundamental misunderstanding that has undermined our security. Exhibit A. Exhibit A is the Iran deal. I think it was a terrible deal. And I don't 
think it's an accident that every few months we hear of Iran launching yet another ballistic missile. Instead of dismantling Iran's nuclear program, we legitimized it. This is a huge threat to the state of Israel. And it is a threat to our country, too. But whatever you think about the Iran deal, I want to make something really clear. Whether you opposed it or supported it, whether you are optimistic or skeptical, and I sense a few skeptics in this room here today, I want you to know it is your right to petition your government on any issue at any time. I think we've got to do everything we can to shore up our alliance. We have to hold Iran accountable for its violations. We have to push back against Iranian aggression in Lebanon, in Yemen, and in Syria. We have to extend our bilateral security agreement with Israel and expand it to also include missile defense. We have to help Israel continue developing the Arrow 3 and David's sling. One more thing, one more thing I worked on quite a bit when I was chair of Ways and Means and throughout my career. We have to push back with clarity, with firmness, against any attempt by any other country to boycott, divest from, or to ever sanction Israel. We have a choice coming. You've got people running for president, they'll get political. But here's what we see. We have a choice coming. We're gonna make a big choice in 2016. And along those lines, in the House, we're gonna try and help crystallize that choice. We have several members on our task force on national security. Their goal is to design a strategy for a competent America. And at the top of that list, is how do, our, how do we strengthen our allegiances with our allies like Israel? To sum up our approach, I would use the words of General James Madison. We need to take our own side in this fight. There is a side to be taken. And as we put together our agenda for the next president, we are going to need the help of APEC and everyone here today. But, and I can see, we need especially the help of the young people that are here in this room. <laughs> you know why? And by the way, it's so great to see you, but you know why? Because the decisions that we're going to make today, those decisions will determine what kind of world you will inherit. Just seeing you here, Knowing that you want to take part gives me a lot of hope for our future. Because with your help, I know we can do this. And so, I want to leave you with this. I think we need to build a confident America. The way I see it, a confident America does not shrink from our commitments or shunt aside our allies. A confident America does not distance itself from Israel or cozy up to Iran. A confident America, a confident America keeps its word. It stands by our allies. A confident America stands by Israel because that's what will keep the peace. That is what both countries need to thrive. 
I know I just threw a lot out at you. And you're probably thinking, what does a guy from James, Wisconsin care about Israel? But before I leave, I just want to say that there's actually a vibrant Jewish community in Wisconsin. And every one of them are diehard Green Bay Packer fans. This is something that we are very proud about in Wisconsin. I should say that there's also a huge pro-Israel community, full of people from both parties and in many different faiths and all walks of life. In fact, when my wife Jan and I go to visit different houses of worship from all denominations, one of the most frequent questions I get as I travel throughout Wisconsin is, what's your position on Israel? So the pro-Israel community, it is not just some constituency to me. These are my friends, my family, my neighbors. I know the pro Israel community has done so much for Wisconsin and for the world. You will always have my deepest gratitude. And so, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you again for having me tonight. I want to thank you in advance for all the work that you will be doing to help us strengthen that essential friendship and that bond between Israel and America. And I want to thank you for being fantastic Americans and helping make sure that we get our ship of state right. Thank you so much for having me. God bless you. Have a great time.